Sounds good. My name is Ismael Martinez, Izzy for short. I am working at SFE in mathematics. I work with Randall and a couple of their professors. I'm also working for a web VR startup. We're looking at a virtual conferencing concept at the moment. This is the StatOil C Core Iceberg Classification Challenge. We have about 3,300 teams participating in this. Prize money was 25. K for the top uh, winner, 15, and then 10 for second and third place. And it was quite a recent competition, ended June 23rd. This is my first presentation, so please don't put me on the spot. Actually, you can put me on the spot. I will just put it up to you guys to answer the question if I don't know it. <laughs> uh, moving on, so Stad Oil is an energy company. They work in ocean mining for gas and oil, whereas Secor is the satellite end. So they are a satellite R&D corporation, which uses corp uh, computer vision-based surveillance. Together, they are looking for a computer vision algorithm to be able to identify icebergs in the ocean in areas that stat oil would be mining. So why is it so important to catch these icebergs? Apparently, icebergs cause a threat to ships. Uh, this is actually the very first line on the competition page for this one. The background, so we're working with the Sentinel-1 satellite. It's 600 kilometers over the Earth. They use a C-man radar, bounces energy signals off of objects, records the echo. Because it's radar energy, we don't have to worry about clouds, fog, nighttime, daytime, or anything of that sort. Solid objects will bounce back more energy, and thus they will show up as brighter spots on the radar, very similar to a blip on a ship radar. And we will, we will see some example of images later. Um, take into account the high and low winds do affect the lightness and darkness of the image. We are given two channels for our images, HH and HV. So it's the same frequency, but the bands of the frequency are either sent horizontally, and, or sorry, they are always sent horizontally, but they can be received horizontally or vertically. This image is a little backwards based on what we're actually looking at. Um, so in the image they are sent vertically, we are actually always sending horizontally. And so when part of our data is two channels for our images. Here are some examples of what those images look like. Again, on the uh, top, we have icebergs, HH and HV. And then on the very end, color composite, if you put those two bands together. And on the bottom, there are ship examples. Each image that is given is 75 by 75 pixels. And this is important to note, they are not standard 0 to 255 pixel integers. They're actually floating point numbers, and these are representative of decibels. They could be negative. Can you go back a couple slides for this one? This is ex extremely challenging. This is a very difficult It's a really difficult task. Is it? So, as far as we said, there should be easy. easy. Oh, 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 easy for humans to identify icebergs versus ships? I don't think so. Based on based on some of the images I saw. The iceberg looks like it has more of like a leading effect, like it's kind of a tail. Yeah, yeah so, so the, the, the only, only thing, thing that, that I could that really, really do is there's that, there's also... ...to be longer. Sorry, Ducky? Please repeat what people say. Sorry about that. Um, but yes, so uh, Charles mentioned that icebergs tend to have a bleeding effect. That, that is true, and well, maybe that's a identifier. Oh, fuck. Yeah, it's not easy because it maybe looks like uh, the ships tend to uh, have more of both HH and HV and the icebergs. Uh, the, they change the colorization of the ships. Sorry, like the HV component of the iceberg seems to be this. You're saying that the, the HH and HV components are similar for the ships, 
But for the ships, for, for the ships, it seems much. like uh, the, the signal that comes back is pretty depolarized. The HH and the HP are pretty similar to each other. But for the iceberg, it seems like HH is much stronger than HP. Yeah. Right. Just from those pictures. Okay. So. Yes. So he was saying that the HH seems to be a lot stronger, less depolarized than uh, for the icebergs than with the ships, whereas both channels seem similar for the ships. Uh, okay, so the aside from the two bands, we also get incidence angle. So incidence angle is the angle, so is, oh, well, it is over here. So the angle from the radar hitting the ground, again, between the radar angle and the normal vector to the Earth. So it is not the depression angle, but it does depend on where exactly it does hit. So in terms of data, we have our two bands, HH, HV. We have our incidence angle. There are some NAs in the training set. However, there are no NAs in the test set. We have our image ID and our target is iceberg zero or one. Our evaluation, we're looking at binary log loss. So N being the total number of data sets, P is our probability, and Y is the true uh, class of the object. I'm breaking down binary log loss a little. So here we have these two terms. Only one term is going to contribute to the sum. If the class, if the true class is one, y equals one, and one minus y is going to be zero, so then that second term uh, won't get counted. We are only looking at the log of our probability. Likewise, if our true class is zero, that first term is zero, and that second term we're looking at log one minus our probability. As to why our binary log loss is negative, quick recap of the log function, it is negative between zero and one, so we take the negative just to flip it positive. Leaderboard, so this is the top 10 in terms of their final scores. It's not as tight as some other Kaggle competitions have been in the past. So here they range from 0.08 to 0.105 or so, uh, and then it's seen the majority of people uh, once we get to 50th place to 100th place, everyone kind of clusters around 0.13. Actually, I think it's 50th to like 200th. So what is the metric of the leaderboard? Is that error? Log loss. Log loss. The, the metric is log loss. Also, no. It's, it's uh, this formula here. Well, it, it's just log loss, right? Binary log loss is not. All, all log loss is binary, and then multiple. And when you're doing a fully classes, it's like cross entropy. So I think it's, as, as far as the terms, I think it's binary log loss and multi-class log loss. Yeah, okay. I could be wrong. Oh, I think it's anyway, right. Yeah, I think you, if you were to just say log loss, then you can assume binary, and then you would have to explicitly state the multi-class version. Yeah. Okay. Oh, sorry. Yes. Uh, that guy jumped up to 500. Yes. Yeah, so I, I forgot to mention that. I don't know what he did. That's, so the ninth place person, thank you, Dougie, the ninth place person jumped up 529 spots. Mike mentioned that as well. We don't know why, but he just did. It's, it's pretty impressive. If, is this a difference between private and public sorority? This is... Okay, thank you. I did, actually didn't know that, but yes. When it goes to private, when it scores you on the whole thing, then they show you a difference between your public score and your private score. When, when you, so the, the jumps here are based on public versus private. So when you switch over to private, then it switches. Uh, that's where you see these jumps here. So... Competition goal, the determine whether an image that's given is an image, uh, sorry, is an iceberg or not. And our submission, that's our CSV file on the end there, it is simply our image ID and our, our probability of whether it's an iceberg. 
data leak. So there isn't much data, but there is a data leak in the incidence angle. And what people found was that almost all of the all of objects within a cluster of incidence angles are the same. So here in the first image, it's a, it's all the same incidence angles. One capture, everything in that image is an iceberg. Similarly, in the second image, one incidence angle, one capture, everything in that image is a ship. So we will see later a 14th place solution who just use the data leak for everything. Basically, they, they were to say, if the test data has an instant angle that's in the training data, just put that label there. Uh, Alex first. Uh, sorry, I, I don't know if it could be considered a data leak. It's a physical property if you plot. Uh, do, basically, the re reflection like in decibels versus the incidence angle, uh, like there are lots of research papers that actually see how different things like background and then there's ships and icebergs, they kind of cluster. It's, I don't know if it's a real data leak. Yeah, so you're, you're saying that it's... Diverging it, the physical properties of that data. It might not be a data leak that the icebergs and ships are clustered in incidence angles. That is true. Um, and, and some people did take that into account. I'm saying it, it is also data leak because some people just look at the test data and then map it to the training data and say, if this is, has a similar instance angle, we're just gonna pop the label over. And so they don't even bother with the computer vision aspect of it. Ducky, did you have a question? Yeah, I was gonna ask if the incidence angle meant uh, or described what the latitude was because the satellite was in a different position on the iceberg ones, it happened to be taking pictures of the South Pole, and for the ship's ones, it was taking the uh, photos of 40 degrees north or something like that. So you're saying whether whether the incidence angles had any concept of latitude? Whether that gave you the latitude. I'm whether whether that gave you the latitude. I'm not I'm not sure exactly. Um, a lot of people just use the incident angle as it was, without any concept of latitude or longitude. Mike? So in the example images we have here, yeah. would these be the ones that have been in the training set, or are they like split up and then put in a separate training images? So like the sort of the, the points you can see the icebergs, are they split into like 20 by 28 images? So So Mike asked whether the images here are the ones that are given to you or whether they are uh, kind of compressed around the object. So the images that are actually given to you are, um, I'll have to go back a bit, are similar to this. Basically, we take the full image of the, the incident angle, that's just a, to give you an example of how the incident angles are, but this is what they actually look like. So it, it hones in on each object there and just gives you the 75 by 75 pixel image of the object centered. So have they, take, have they just taken like a few super resolution images and then chopped it up? Like Did they take one super resolution image and chop it up? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know the answer to that one. Sorry, could you, could you rephrase the question? So basically what I'm saying is when I looked at this presentation first, my understanding was that, that the data leak was that they took multiple images of the same exact object, which resulted in the same incident angle, and some of those images got into the training set. Mm. So you're, you're saying that your understanding was that they took multiple images of the, of the same that object? The, some of the data in the test set was the same data, the same actual Yeah, so the, the training set and the test set data are completely different. The data leak is more that the incidence angles uh, tended to be, if the incidence angles were the same, they tend to be the same object. Why? Uh, it's a physical property. 
property that if you have uh, the same material, whether it's water, ice, or uh, metal, like a ship, so there's a high correlation between the incidence angle and the signal that you get back, which are basically the values. In the so the incidence angle is not the actual physical angle at which the object moves. So the incidence angle is uh, the angle at which the object is viewed. 90 degrees minus the angle at which the object is viewed. So Yeah, that, that's what my comment was about. It's not a datum read per se, it's a physical property of the data that you work with. Thank you, Alex. So uh, back to whoa, back to Alex's point about not exactly a data leak. So again, it kind of comes down to how the data is used because we look at the exact same thing here, except we're using the incidence angle slightly differently. So here we're looking at nearest neighbors, and we are essentially looking at an incident angle, looking at a window of incidence angle, and then seeing what are the objects that are within this window, and then we create that as a new feature for an object. So if an object is in a cluster of icebergs, a very high chance it's an iceberg. If it's a cluster of ships, a uh, very high chance as a ship. Common approaches, we have convolutional neural networks, CNNs. We have boosting, which I will go over in a little bit of detail. XGBoost and LightGBM was used a lot. Choosing models based on K-fold cross-validation. So there were some people who would train multiple tens or 100 CNNs. And then they would calculate the cross-validation of all of these CNNs and only pick the top five that had the best K-fold or five-fold cross-validation. We had ensembling and K-fold stacking, which I'll go over a bit. K-N regressors, so that is the K-nearest neighbors looking at the incident angle window and then choosing the top K ones that share similar properties. And then some people just didn't use the instance angle at all, so they focused on the computer vision aspect and only looking at the, the image and the features of the image, regardless of where it's sat. Quick recap, k-fold cross-validation. So we split our data into k-folds. For most people, they use five. So I'll use five as an example here. They split the data into five folds. They train on four of them and then test on the fifth. Then they do that again, train on one, two, three, five, test on four. And they do that throughout. They take the errors of every single one of those uh, images, and that becomes your five-fold cross-validation. From k-fold cross-validation, we can look at k-fold stacking, which is very similar, except instead of taking the errors, we end at the probabilities. So uh, in the first example, we take folds one through four, and then test it on, sorry, train on one through four, test it on five, and there we will get uh, these bottom probabilities, 81 through 100. And then we do that again, one, two, three, and five, test on four to get 61 through 80, and we do that five times. Then the stacking portion is we take those probabilities and they become the inputs to our next model. And we do k-fold uh, stacking again. This time I put down four folds, 
just to change it up, but you can use the same fold every single time. A lot of people just use five throughout all of their runs. And then we get our P2, our second set of probabilities at the end. And you can do this as many times as you want. And then K nearest neighbor, so again, looking at the actual physical properties of the icebergs. So for our point, uh, so say that this one here is our point, we would look at the K, say five, nearest incidence angled uh, objects. And then what is their target class? What is the true class of those objects? So here, if we choose five of them, say four, four of them are icebergs, one is the ship, then we have 80% or 0.8 is our k and n regressor for our circled object there. Sorry, you're asking whether they only use the training data or whether they predicted their test data? Yes, and then validate using nearest neighbors. And then validate using nearest neighbors. I don't think, I didn't see anybody do that. For most people, this became a feature uh, going into their training prior to the testing predictions. Okay, so there's a, what we're looking at is a top-down view based on a single incidence angle. So here is our incidence angle. We'll say that everything along this line is the same incidence angle. And then so this is kind of like the window that I showed before, where we're just looking at the closest objects, or sorry, the objects with the closest incidence angles. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, so you, you thought that our data was given in little chips and didn't have any sense of location. So in our data, what we're actually given is the image, so the little chip, but we're also given the incidence angle of it. So in this image, the way I've drawn it, it's not a radius. So there is no longitude or latitude. What we're looking at is the incidence angle of the different points. Ducky. I don't know if it's a satellite picture. I imagine it's, it is. It's bigger than 75 pixels by 75 pixels. So, this is input data. This is, this is not input data. So th these are just examples that were given on the Kaggle competition, but this isn't actual data examples. So the data examples are just the 75 by 75 small images, the little chips. So this image is This image is uh, something that was given on the Kaggle competition webpage. Okay. As an example of the story. So I think they it yeah. As an example. Okay. Yeah. But yes, uh, so as Bruce mentioned, they take a big picture, essentially, and then they chop it up into little, little chunks, little chips of, of just the, the actual images that we want to locate. And same thing with ship data, we'll notice whether there's a blip or not. We need to focus on that object, but what they're wondering is whether that's an iceberg or not. If there's no blip, we don't care. Yep. Are they single snapshots in time? So the satellite, this, the satellite will rotate and pass 14 times per day. So in terms of time, it could be any of those 14 snapshots within a day. For a given ship or iceberg, you're only getting one snapshot of the size. For a given ship or iceberg, yes, you are get only given one snapshot. I see, I see. Yep, Dan. Are there objects like either ships or icebergs in all the images, or some images without are there objects in, with ships or icebergs in all uh, instances? So this is, this is a larger snapshot, but in terms of the training data, we're only given uh, snapshots of, we're just given bite-sized piece of these with the icebergs or ships. So we won't have just ocean. Yeah. 
training data observations. I'm trying to think. I want to say how many observations I. I want to say something like 16,000 observations and 10 times more in the test data. Don't know off the top of my head. I don't remember. Okay. Uh, so I'll go into boosting in a minute, but a quick recap of what a decision tree is. So on the left-hand side, we have a bunch of data points. We have X is one class, and then the dots are another class, positive class, X is our minor class. We make a decision boundary by asking a question. So in this case, our question is, is X less than five? If yes, we'll say it's positive. If no, we'll say it is negative. So then on the right, we have our decision tree as to what that actually looks like. We have all of our data at the top. And then we ask our question, is X less than five? On the left, we go positive. On the right, we go negative. Now going into boosting. So in boosting is an ensemble method. We join many weak learners and we take their, their different strengths while overcoming their weaknesses. So what that means is when one model misclassifies a certain points, the next model will try to rectify those points, but it might misclassify others. And then we keep going in that way. And so some models are gonna be better at different classifications than others. What that looks like, so here we have our first model. We have, we say is X less than five? One, one way is positive to the left. If not, then we'll say it is negative. We misclassify uh, these bottom points here and then this point. So we'll make a second model. And then second model will focus in on those misclassified points and we'll say is Y less than five? then it is negative, otherwise it's positive. And we notice that what we misclassified the first time, we classify properly the second time. However, we misclassify two points at the top. So we try one more time. This time we focus in on those points that were misclassified. We say, is X less than 10? We classify the positive point to the right. If it's, not less, if it's greater than or equal to 10 and negative to the left, if you look at the three models, you'll notice that every single point is correct in two out of three of those models. So when we do an ensembling of them, we actually get everything correct. We, we basically do a voting and say, this is, this is correct, or sorry, we take the, the most, the sign of the different models. So if it's positive in two and negative in one, our overall signs are gonna be positive and then otherwise negative. Yeah. Can you go back to the previous slide? Yeah. Are those supposed to be operating on the same data? Is it operating on the same data? Yes. Okay, because it's different data. No, they're, they're all the same data. Oh, right, I see. Sorry, the, the circles are positive, the X's are negative. The, the red is misclassified. But yes, and then these are decision tree example as to what is going on. So here we have, we ask the question, is X less than five? But instead of just stopping there, then we'll say, is Y less than five on one end, or is X less than 10 on the other end? And we end up getting everything correct. A more advanced way, sorry, more advanced version of boosting is instead of just taking all the models uh, as they are with the same weight, we add an extra weight alpha. And these alphas are actually based on the error. So the more, class, more misclassified data points will result in a smaller weight. Less misclassified data points result in a larger weight. So we'll focus, we'll take the average of those more than others. All right, now we'll, we'll go into different versions of boosting. So there's XGBoost, which most people here have heard of and has been used a lot in Kaggle. As placed first in many CAG competitions. So XGBoost uses something called level-wise tree growth, whereas something that has been a little bit more recent, LightGBM. LightGBM uses leaf-wise tree growth. So instead of just stage one, and then we do a full stage two, then we choose which leaf we want to split up, and we'll go through there, and then choosing them in, in a certain way.
So then, which one, which one is better? LightGBM has been a lot more recent than XGBM, or than XGBoost. LightGBM is, the word light is faster. It's faster training and higher efficiency. It also has the lower memory usage. Now, a little double-edged sword, it produces more complex trees, which results in better accuracy, but it can lead to overfitting as a result. For larger training sets, though, it is faster than XGBoost with equally accurate results. So when, what it comes down to is, if you're ensembling many models, why not use both? But if you're constrained by time, by memory, by computing power, LightGBM is a really great place to start. Okay. Now going into the solution. So this is an iceberg classification. Can it? Yeah, so there's, there's no latitude longitude, there's only angle of incidence. So say, yeah. It's, okay, but, but yes, it is basic. Every, every single object has an angle of incidence. So close objects will have a close angle of incidence. And by close angle of incidence, I, I mean something like four or five decimal places down. So, Alex, what is it like four or five decimal places for angle of incidence? Something of that sort? Well, because the field of view of those satellites is fairly small. They, they look either to the left or to the side. Because yeah. it's an, uh, unlike like optical instruments, it's not a passive instrument. It's an active instrument, right? So you're actually sending the signal down to the ground and then you catch the reflection. And that's the reason why you need to look to the side, because if you send it down and then like pretty much everything's gonna come back up, it's, you're gonna oversaturate and not see anything at all. So that's why you kind of see there's like a small slit, that's you know, how you can imagine. So you can only see like a very small portion of the Earth. Okay, so onto the solutions. So this one touches a bit more on the clustering of the objects around incidence angle. So first place, it made a few observations. What they noted is that incidence angles with identical values up to four decimal places. So we're saying two objects with 45.000x had the same label 97% of the time. So they split the data into two groups, one being full clusters of icebergs, another being clusters of icebergs and ships. So icebergs happen a lot more frequently than ships do. Here's an example of what that looks like. So the yellow being icebergs, so there are certain instance angles where they're just pure icebergs and not a ship in sight. And then other instance angles where we have some icebergs and some ships. They notice this alternating pattern. So here we'll see uh, group two and then group one, group two, group one. And they said that this pattern propagates throughout the entire data set. So what did they use? They used a pipeline of 100 different CNN models. Uh, they used a range of VGG, GoolNet, DenseNet, other ones. Um, some included incidence angle in the dense layer, some did not. They ensembled the models. They applied a threshold. So say the threshold is 0.8. Basically said if your prediction is above 0.8, we're just going to set it to 0.9999. If it's below 0.2, we're just going to set it to 0.0001. And then they retrained 100 CNN on group two only. So again, that's the group with the icebergs and the ships. And it made some improvement in ship detection. Their public score, 0.0801, and the private, 
Then we have second solution, a second place. Uh, they use hundreds, their words, hundreds of CNNs with a fixed five-fold cross-validation classification. So by fixed five-fold, we, what we mean by that is that they would have the same five-fold split on every single one of their hundred CNN models. So there isn't any change uh, in those folds. They did not train any images with missing incidence angle. So those NAs, they just toss them out. They looked at three families. The first family is CNNs trained from scratch. So nothing fancy there. Um, no, no fancy pre-trained models, I should say. The second family was to fine tune VGG and they added a third angle, so a third channel. So we have band one, band two, and then third channel is band one plus two over two, which is the average of these two bands. And then the last one is they, I don't know what model exactly, they just said doubling their training set with pseudo labeling. They did claim it didn't help. So Kenneth? So he's asking how, how do we change the images, uh, the channels, when we pass them into VGG because VGG is based off of integers and we have floating point numbers, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, the number of channels. Yes. Okay, so VGG is based on three channels. We have two channels. So I'm not actually sure. Sorry? Oh, how, how do they organize the tensors when feeding into VGG? So as far as the number of channels, we, the number of channels is, is correct because we've added the third channel, so RGB. Now we have band one, band two in the average. As far as the scaling of the images, that I'm not sure what they did. And I don't know if they black padded it or they upsized it. I have no idea. We have a question from the live stream. Oh, wow. Is there an advantage to fixed K-fold? Wouldn't it make the model less robust? Is there an advantage to fixed K-fold? Would it make the model less robust? Uh, I don't. I don't personally know. Does anyone else know? What's the alternative? Changing yeah, changing the yeah. the alternative would be changing the the split. So in this one, they fixed the five fold split. So we have folds one through five, and that propagates throughout the entire data set or throughout, throughout all your models. Sorry? Yes. <laughs> I'm not going to take that for uh, it. If you that. have, if you're trying to compare two models or two different parameter selections, uh, and then, and you don't fix the uh, k-folds, I get you don't it. Fix the same split. Okay. Then you might just split the data such that it's really easy to predict the answer in one split. Yeah. So the the ad, the advantage, I, I I'm going to reboard it a yeah. third time. But, but I think what, the, what they're trying to say is that if you fix a K-fold, then you get to see how the different models are performing, right? As opposed to the data. If we have an easier K-fold on one, on one model and a harder K-fold on another model. Fixing them, we'll see 
which models actually perform better. Because you do cross-validation with a fine-tuned parameter. It's not necessarily as a final model. Okay. Uh, so I think, yeah, so the last, the last family was doubling the trainer set with pseudo-labeling. Second place, uh, we had many weak learners and data augmentation. A lot of random parameter settings. So this is the tuning portion where, again, they had hundreds of CNNs. So they would tune them slightly differently with a different number of filters, a different number of, a different number of neurons in the dense layers, different values of convolution dropout. So for the dropout, they had uh, 0 0.01 and 0 0.02 for the convolution dropout, and for the dense dropout, 0 0.025 and 0 0.05, different learning rates, augmentation settings, uh, and optimization methods. It says second place CNN. Oh, that's that's because the uh, we'll see later. Okay. They did it in stages. So stage one was their CNNs. So this all has to do with training their convolutions. But a CNN is not a weak learner. I would, I, well, I oh, would not call it CNN. yeah. So so the the first part of this slide is hundreds of CNNs. Um, so this weak is learners. This is, this is in their CNN portion because the, the parameter settings is in the convolution layer. The, the parameter settings have to do with co uh, convolutions. I'll have to look. Well, maybe, yeah, maybe they just call it a... I mean, the CNNs could be not very accurate, so it's a weak learning. The CNNs could be very shallow. Weak means it's not... It could be shallow as well. I thought weak would just be less, less uh, parameters. Well, which would entail not very accurate. I think if you have a sophisticated model that's giving you crappy answers, it's a weak. You <laughs> <laughs> might want to tell the audience at home that we're arguing about the definition of weak learners and strong learners. Fair enough. So we're we're arguing, we're we're talking, discussing <laughs> about a weak learner and strong learners when it comes to CNN. So the way that I interpreted it is because they have so many CNNs, I think they're very shallow CNNs, or they have very few filters or very few neurons in the dense layers, and that's why they're considered weak learners. I think so. Alex. Uh, could you elaborate a little bit on uh, what data augmentation is for? Ooh. If you have that information. I don't have a handy. I don't have the data augmentation handy as to what they performed. I think there were, I want to say eight to 10 different things, but uh, I know zooming, flipping, turning, um, so flipped upside down, turn it, uh, shifting like that. I know they did zoom. So there's there's a few there. And I don't, I don't know about anything. There's no cropping or anything of that sort. But there is, there is turning, flipping, and zooming for sure. Okay. And then for XGBoost, so from the hundreds of CNNs, they made several groups of 5, 10, 15, and 20 models for each fold. And then they selected each of the three for each. Yeah, so, so what that means is that you train all of your CNNs, pick five from family one, pick five from family two, pick five from family three. Then they train their XGBoost on the following set of inputs. And they, again, perm perform parameter tuning. So very similar with the CNN models, they just had a bunch of different parameters with a bunch of different XGBoost models, and they would tweak every single one slightly differently. And then we have observations. So there's, uh, they took, I think there's a min, mean, oh, these are all, these are all on the incidence angle only. So from a cluster of instant angle, they would take the min, mean, and so forth of those, and then have each one of those be a separate feature. Then they did the same thing, min, mean, medium, max, standard deviation, and quantiles of the two bands. And then again, adding those as features. So we went from two, um, two channels and one feature to 
a bunch of new features added on before we go into our new XGBoost models. And then we also, as features, we also took the total count of total count of objects, train counts, ship counts of objects within a certain window of instance angle. This was a little unclear as to, that should say angle, sorry, that's a typo there. Whether it should, it is identical, whether it is uh, the same but to four or five decimal places, that I'm not too sure. But yes, they, they took all of these different stats for the angles and the bands, and they put them as separate features before training their XG boost. They also did K nearest neighbors. Again, so looking at, for a given object, looking at the objects around that one to, to look at their instance angles and the mean predictions of those objects, and then choose the K ones that are closest <clears throat> to ours. And then we would put our instant angles bin. So I feel like this is, again, what the clustering as a first place did. They would cluster them into these groups before our XG boost. And then finally, we would take our CNN results and our XG boost results. And then we'd again retrain our XG boost, or sorry, retrain our XG boost results on more conservative settings. So changing the depth of the trees, the number of samples, tree depth, sorry, minimum children, how, how much we split these up. And then we would model average them with our CNNs and our retrained XG boosts. 95% model average of 100 best XG boosts. Uh, that's including incidence angle. And 5% uh, of, of the 100 best without incidence angle. And then they, they achieved a private score of 0.0855 there. Alex. Uh, I know that the, uh, they measured the performance on the log loss, but did anyone measure kind of more intuitive metrics like accuracy, recall, or that bond score to kind of get a sense of what their performance was? Did anyone use their own metrics of recall or accuracy, was, like, more intuitive records? As, as far as what I was reading, everybody trained on log loss. Everyone just tried to get better results via log loss. Nobody had to use bet other metrics, such as accuracy or recall. Okay, uh, going into third place solution. So okay. the second place solution I called the brute force approach because they had hundreds of CNNs. This one, they had seven. Uh, they had they said ANN artificial neural network, um, so I'm guessing it's it's just a, a deep dense net. wasn't wasn't specified to be convolution whatsoever here. They used five fold stackings with thirty stages. They had different architectures, normalization, and data augmentation. Again, with data augmentation. It's on the forums as to what that was. Uh, I'm not sure. I don't have that information on hand. But again, they, they would tweak, tweak these architectures slightly. And then they did, uh, again, mixed ANN predictions using XGBoost, seven-fold stacking and a hundred, sorry, a thousand stages, my bad, Kenneth. Stages. So going back to k-fold stacking, if we go up a bit. Mm. Here. So if we go back to k-fold stacking, so we have our five-fold cross-validation, or five-fold split uh, into model one, and then we got our parameters, our probabilities one. Those become the inputs into our second stage. And then we again do five folds into model two, and then we get our probabilities for a second stage. And then what they did is they continued. Those probabilities become the inputs for stage three, then stage four, then stage five. So did that 30 like times. Stages. They did that 30. The, the first one was 30, and the second one was 1,000 times. As a, as a lot of, a lot of uh, 
<laughs> so I, that's it's kind of funny you mentioned that. So the first, the first second place solution did hundreds of CNNs, where third place only has seven ANNs, but they did do a thousand stages of stacking. Yes. Yeah, so, <laughs> so I guess uh, fewer models, more stages. This competition was all about brute force. Brute force, and then they had uh, spatial model. So this is where they extracted neighbors from the incidence angle. So. Here they, they said radius, I think they just mean incidence angle because there is no concept of radius in the training data. So what they, what they said is that if a object is alone, if within a window of incidence angle there is no other object, 90% of the time it's a ship or rather it's not an iceberg. Going back, we pretty much are saying that icebergs are clustered, that they kind of travel in groups. So if we have a lone object, chances are it's not an iceberg. Well, and ships are trying to stay away from icebergs too. Yes, ships are trying to stay away. Bad things happen when ships hit icebergs. Then they, they made predictions on new features uh, using XGBoost. Again, a thousand stages, fivefold <laughs> stacking with a thousand stages. Yeah? Question about the the objects were like centered right in the middle of the chip and there was usually like one of them. Uh, have you seen any examples where the object was not centered or there were multiple objects in one chip? So based on the images that were given, are, are all the images centered around an object or are, they, are there some images that are off-centered? So as we saw with the kind of giant view, they take a giant view and then they cut it up. Right, and so everything is pretty much centered because that's that's how they've cut it up. So it's not it's not an instance angle, and then they give you that raw image. They take an image, and then they will manually cut all of these different pieces out and give them to you. So we have two independent predictions: our our P ones, which are A and N mixed based on image data. And then we have our spatial model, which is this one, which takes into account the uh, objects around that model in incidence angle. And then they use this formula. Sorry? Uh, speaking of the score, is there a way to translate the score to, I don't know how good the models are, like what is the probability that they, they'll get like the right classification? Sorry? Uh, how, do, how does the score translate to how good the models were classified uh, in an aggregate uh, ship. He's looking for an accuracy metric. Instead oh. Of, well, accuracy directly, but if you get everything correctly, the metric is zero. If you get absolutely every single thing wrong, uh, it's, it's one. So it's no more accurate, right? So it's not normal. Oh, it, could be, it could be infinitely large, but if you get everything correctly, then it's zero, right? Yeah. Even if you're guessing, on all the ones that are labeled one, you label as 0.95, and all the ones that are zero, you label as 0.05, you're still going to get a positive score. So even though you were correct, like with the easy threshold, you're still going to get a positive log loss. So in in terms of yeah, so in terms of interpreting log loss, it is really tricky to do because they are logs. How do we interpret? log values exactly. Um, there isn't really an easy way to interpret it, but as Matt said, the smaller it is, the better accuracy we have. So the closer to zero we are, the, the better our model is. And the closer to one, the more in trouble we are. I can give you some context. Uh, there is a similar competition with cats versus dogs. There is a competition where you do the same thing, which is cat or a dog. Very similar binary classification. The log loss, uh, that was easy. And the lowest log losses were around 0 .0, 0 .03, 0 .04. I was able to get a log loss of 0.05 or 0 .06, and I had a 99% accuracy. So it's it's very good. It's like 0 .08 is is pretty good. If you're doing like you're getting most of them, and it's just oh yeah. 
It's a, it's it's impossible to translate log loss to accuracy, but I can say that point oh eight is is good. Yeah, it's it is very hard to translate accuracy to log loss, but the under point oh eight is is very good, is way above ninety percent, and so. Again, they have their two probabilities. They're mixed based on just image data and then their spatial models based on the incidence angle. So the radius or the incident angle window, if there's nothing, it's probably not an iceberg. If there's a cluster, then it likely is an iceberg. Then for their final probability, they grab uh, this formula here. So the first and second probability multiplied over first two plus one minus P1 times one minus P2. And so their private score was 0 0.0871. So again, I did mention that for submissions, they were allowed two final submissions. So this was their first final submission. And then they decided, we're gonna keep going and then see if we can beat our previous one. So they trained five out of seven purely based on time. They only had enough time to train five of them with pseudo-labeling. And then they, again, did mix and n pseudo-labeling predictions with XGBoost, seven folds, a thousand repeats, a thousand stages. Retrained the spatial model with their pseudo-labeling to improve their accuracy. And then they mixed the above two predictions using the previous formula from up here and they got a better score, the final score being 0 0.0857. Okay. So fourth place, trained five CNN models, purely on image data. So they didn't use uh, the incident angle for their image training. They used five whole class validations. They used the same split, again, a fixed split across all the models. They were chosen um, so that the validations were similar. So they would, they would try different five-folds and then try to get the ones that had similar error across the board. And then they would choose the best uh, CNN models. So the, the CNN architecture that they use here, this is, this is a pretty standard CNN architecture. They, they took it from, I think it was food processing on deep learning. It was just a, one that you find in a lot of papers. So they, did, they didn't do anything fancy or, or really out and beyond. And then they would uh, group the results by instance angle for both test and training data. So this one, this one was interesting. And then they would calculate mean, median, total number of sam samples within a range of incidence angles. And then they would run K nearest neighbors. So they would look at the, the K closest objects to a single object that had the closest incidence angle. Train light, so they focused on light GBM for the fourth place one, uh, based on the previous features. So our incidence angle, their uh, K and N regressors, mean, median, and total samples within cluster. And then, they would clip things. So I saw this a lot as well. Uh, they would clip their final probability. So I, I made an error there. I apologize. Uh, what, it, what it should say is 0 0.001 goes to 0 0.01 and 0.999 goes to 0.99. My bad there. But yes, they would clip that final uh, decimal and a lot of people did that basically is so that if you were to get something wrong, you're not penalized as heavily. And then 14 place solution. So this is what I mean by data leak specifically. Uh, this is, I didn't call it the leaky solution. They call it the leaky solution. And they also call it their exploits one through four. So first exploit. If your probability, if your prediction is greater than 0.5, so it's pretty sure it's an iceberg, and your incidence angles in the training set, bam, we go 0.999. We're gonna say, yes, it's an iceberg. Likewise, if it's under 0.5 and the incidence angles in the training set, so under 0.5 and training set says it's not an iceberg, 
we just set it to 0 0.001. Otherwise, we just give it our prediction. Second exploit. The instance angle in their test set is not in the training set. Then we take the majority rule of all our predictions and we just set everything. Uh, sorry, we take the majority rule and then whether it's an iceberg or not an iceberg, we set everything to 0.999 or 0.001. Third, if our instant angle is in the training set, but predictions contradict. So here, training set says, yes, it's an iceberg, but our prediction is 0.25, for example, a prediction that it's likely not an iceberg. Then we take, again, majority rule of our, all our predictions, and then we set them high. So basically, the trend here is that if we're pretty sure it's an iceberg, we're just going to set as high as possible. And then finally, they do the clipping. So this is what the other one should have said. 0 0.001 goes to 0 0.01. 0 0.999 goes to 0 0.99. And then there's their final score is 0 0.096. Okay. They could have uh, they could have set everything to 0 0.01 and 0 0.99 to start with. I think what they did was they tried exploit one through three. They tried different things, looked at their results on the board, and then they finally did the clipping. Then they saw that the results went up. So I think I think what when it comes to the clipping, it was a final measure of can we boost our results just a hair more? And in most cases, it did work. Uh, that, is, that is everything. So if you have any questions uh, based on previous slides, otherwise, thank you very much. Yeah? Mm. Oh, sorry. Uh, was, was the 14th place solution using the image data at all? They, they didn't mention what model they trained, but they did train a model because this, this, is based on, this is based on a prediction, right? If the training data was an iceberg and our prediction was over 0.5, then we'll set it to 0.999, right? So they have to get that prediction probability from somewhere. They were they doing k-means clustering on the instance angle? Not as far as I know. Not as far as I could see. Um, that that is one thing about the fourteen place solution. They didn't say what model they used or how they got these predictions. They they just trained a model, um, or they trained their model without telling us what it was, and then ran these different exploits based on the data leak. Yeah. I, I love the solution too. If you know the distribution of your data, you exploit you exploit it. Yeah. I I love this. I had to put this in here. Um, I was like, okay, first place, second place, third, fourth, okay, but fourteenth has to be in there because I love their solution so much. Yeah, the question about the uh, training that was provided. Uh, what was the format of the images that were provided, and what was the range of values of the image? And what was the size of them, like on average? What was the what was the format, size, and values? Uh, the what do you mean by format? So the size was seventy five by seventy five pixels. Yeah, so so the the images that were provided. I don't like to say PNG or something else. Well, they said they were EVs. They were, as, as far as the range, I, I don't know exactly. So I looked at the data a, a while ago, but I don't remember what the range was. Um, the format? No, so, so they were, they were, were just, um, so there's a, just a 75 by 75 array of values. Yeah, so it wasn't like PNG or JPEG or anything. It was just a, a 75 by 75 uh, matrix of, of values for each band. Sure. Yeah. 
uh, how the color comp. How was the color composite formed here? I don't know. I, I think it was just uh, similar to RGB stacking the channels. You just stack the HH and HV, and this is what it looks like, I guess. Yeah, I don't know. I, I have no idea there. Sorry? So, so his guess is that you have one image as the x coordinate and the second image is the y coordinate, and then you get an angle from that, and then you can color code those angles. Okay. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not sure how exactly the color composites were for formed. It is different data than we're used to. Again, we're used to 0 to 255 integer uh, RGB channels, uh, whereas this is floating point. And there's two channels, not three. Did anybody use the angle of incidence and timestamp? There was no timestamp. There's no timestamp, so it's only band one, band two, and, and incidence angle. We got no other info. Yeah? Would you be able to rank the, the first four methods in terms of how intensive they were digitally? Sorry? What would be your guess in terms of how intensive the, the, four, the first four solutions were computationally? How intensive were the first four solutions? Uh, computationally, the, the first two for sure uh, were pretty uh, intensive as far as I could tell because first place used 100, place, 100 plus CNNs, second place used hundreds uh, of CNNs and thousands of XGBoost layers, whereas uh, the third place only used seven. Third place only used seven. Oh, they, they do a lot of stacking. The fourth place, though, they used very few convolutions, so they had five convolution networks. So first th top three, very computationally um, expensive, whereas the fourth solution, not so much. And I, I was looking, I think it was um, a s another solution a little bit down the line, maybe around 50th place, but they, they weren't uh, so, they didn't do anything crazy as far as number of models or number of layers. They just had maybe five models that they would ensemble as well. It's not hard to get, to get a good score on this using fewer models, but it, it seems that the, the top three solution definitely went, I wouldn't say overboard, but they did use a lot of models to get how, as accurate as they did. Yeah? Last question. You also get a feel like, as Matt mentioned, it all looks like they kind of threw a bunch of things together and some of it worked out, some of it not. There's kind of, it doesn't seem to be following like any scientific approach, but like any reasoning why they're doing something. Did I, did I get a feel that some people just threw things together and tried to see what worked? Absolutely. Uh, especially with the, so the third, I think it was second, but there's a lot of talk of parameter tuning, right? So they would basically make uh, 100 CNN models, make the architectures and neurons different for each one, very slowly, just tweak them. And then whichever one works, that's one we're gonna choose. There was no rhyme or reason to it. That's really yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so any further questions? Any further questions, we can just take them at the pub. Uh, one thing that we like to do here is try to connect people that are interested in learning data science and want to work on a competition together. It's probably one of the best ways of kind of getting into machine learning and getting into data science is to do it with a buddy or do it with a couple other people. So I'll just ask anybody that's that's interested in that. Uh, Manuel already said that he's interested in doing one of the competition. 
just go to the back right corner and, and see if, well, hopefully, hopefully we get some people that group up over there and then they can form teams. Uh, it might just be Emmanuel. <laughs> uh, and, and another thing uh, in the same regards is uh, some of us have more experience here with data science and machine learning, and we're kind of forming a community. So well, I have I have volunteered to, if there is a new group that's starting out and that it wants to do a learning competition, I can mentor you guys if you are interested. I can kind of point you in the right direction, give you some good resources to use, and kind of help you along in the competition. So if you're interested in that, I'm going to come over to the back right corner, and I'll just uh, offer my services. Uh, there, and I will pitch again to, for people to present. It is an amazing opportunity to learn to public speak. For one, that's that's the thing that I've gained the most out of doing this, uh, and still struggling with, uh, but feeling much better now. And it's also the best way to to learn about a competition, to learn really all the like the nitty bitty grits in a competition. And my girlfriend's laughing at me. Right now, so. <laughs> Uh, did I learn something right doing that? Absolutely. Um, the one, one thing that I did did have to look into a lot, so I didn't know a lot about boosting. Like XGBoost, I had heard of it, of course, but I didn't know what it was. So I did do a deep dive, and I gave a little taste as to what it was here. But I certainly had to go into it a lot. And... And also just the, the kind of, so as you mentioned about the rhyme or reason of it, uh, was there any scientific? A lot of people just try a lot of things and then hope something sticks. I guess that's what data science is. Just <laughs> but yes, this, this is a great learning experience and absolutely anybody who wants to present, this is my first time it showed, but I learned a lot and I hope to do this again. So if that it does interest you, let uh, either myself or Bruce know on Slack, and we can help you pick a competition and help you uh, find some resources. And or send us a message on Meetup. Or send us a message on Meetup. That's probably easier because we're right there at the top. Yep. Yep. Broke is going to happen. Don't worry, Ducky. I thought there was one more thing that I wanted to. Anything else? Sure, I had something else to say. Uh.